I hope you enjoyed this talk. These talks are always offered freely so that no one is ever denied access to them. And your support, or dana, also makes a big difference. Dana is the ancient Pali word for spontaneous generosity of heart. If you feel inspired to support these talks by offering dana, you can do so by visiting my website at www.mindfulvalley.com. Thank you so much. So before I start tonight, I want to confess that I didn't realize when I first started writing the summary of the Noble Eightfold Path that what I had essentially agreed to do was summarize the entirety of the Buddhist teachings, really, in 40 minutes. So, oh my God, or Buddha, you know. <laughs> so I hope you will bear with me and know that this is a really extremely brief summary of what is essentially you know, 2,600 years worth of teachings that, again, I'll hope to unpack a little bit more for the next couple of months. So I want to start by pointing out that the Buddha's teachings of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is often called the Middle Way, was considered completely radical in its time, revolutionary, you know, 2,600 years ago when the Buddha started teaching it. And at the time of the Buddha, there were actually two fairly extreme beliefs in India about how one could find happiness. And so one of these was self-indulgence, these two extremes, and the other extreme was self-mortification. And so those who believed in self-indulgence or hedonism would utterly, you know, indulge the body in all its sense pleasures, everything it wanted, paying no attention at all to the mind, and, you know, all about serving the body and all its desires. So, you know, they ate a lot, and they drank a lot, and they bought expensive homes and luxuries if they could afford them, and had a lot of sex, and um, <laughs> really worshipped and indulged again, all the body's desires, and they felt this was really the meaning of life. And some of you actually might see examples of this being played out on the world stage here lately, you know, really. And the other group, the self-mortification practitioners, were ascetics who believed the exact opposite. And so they didn't agree with indulgence, and so they aspired to kind of rid the body of all its desires and not allow the body any of its desires. They considered the body kind of a weight that kept them from their true spiritual awakening. So it was the actual extreme opposite belief. So they believed that if they sacrificed their happiness completely and tortured their bodies, literally beating it sometimes and depriving it of you know, anything for instance, like food sometimes, that they would, by doing this, they would achieve great benefit in a next life if they deprived all their uh, bodily desires in this life. So this is what was happening. These are the beliefs that were happening at the time <coughs> that the Buddha was living. And as most of you know, the Buddha was a prince. He was born a prince, Prince Siddhartha. And until his early 20s, he was really showered with luxury. You know, the legend is, is that at birth, some Brahmins or high priests predicted that the Buddha or this prince would either become a great king or that he would be a great spiritual leader. And as you might imagine, his parents didn't want him to become a spiritual leader. They wanted him to be a king. And they wanted him to stay with them and become a lord and inherit the mansion. And so what happened is that they sheltered him from all the things that they thought might upset him or make him become a spiritual leader, really. So staff and visitors weren't supposed to talk about the news with him. And he wasn't allowed outside any of the palace grounds, wasn't allowed to go outside the palace grounds. He was kept there. And in fact, his parents brought all the entertainment to him so they showered him with parties and festivals and exotic dancers sometimes, you know, just kind of gave him whatever he, he wanted. But the Buddha was smart, and he eventually became on to this. 
And one night in his late 20s, he convinced one of his carriage drivers, Chana, to sneak him outside of the palace and into the city. And, you know, this wasn't a one-time thing, by the way. He went out several times. He snuck out. And on one of these clandestine trips, on these, all of these trips, he, he witnessed four things. And so he saw a very old person for the first time, very old. His parents weren't that old, right? And he saw a very sick person, very ill person. And he also witnessed a funeral where a dead body was being carried through the streets. These were all new sights to the Buddha. And so he finally saw the truth of sickness, old age, and death. And the fourth thing that he saw on his final trip was a monk. He saw a shaved-headed monk and was drawn to the peacefulness of this monk, was drawn to the monk's energy and said, ask Chana, who is that man? Why is he dressed in those robes? And so he told him that this was a man who was looking to reduce suffering for himself and others. And so after the Buddha had witnessed these four things, which are called the four sights, in Buddhism you gotta name everything, give them four, eight, six, whatever it is. These are four sights. <laughs> and you know, he after he had seen these things, he couldn't go back to living the way that he had. He, he had seen this. And so he decided eventually that he needed to know more. So at the rather late age of 29, with his parents weeping, you know, he cut off all his hair and he cut his beard off and he put on the saffron robes of a mendicant and became a homeless wanderer. He left everything. It's actually said that he left the palace on the very day that his wife gave birth to his only son, Rahula. And the word Rahula actually means fetter. It's interesting. So having left behind his home and his family, he went out and he sought the guidance of a guru. He wanted a guru. And he actually found two of the most um, accomplished masters. And they both taught him yoga and meditation. And so by studying with these two gurus, it helped him to reach what is called samadhi, these exalted states of concentration and calm and some of the bliss states that come with samadhi. But even after he had really mastered these, he didn't feel like it was enough for enlightenment. It's like, this isn't it. This is, this is not it. Samadhi is not it. So he left with these teachers, bless you, and he decided to practice with the ascetics, those who believed that spiritual freedom was to be found not only by denying the body of its wants, but by afflicting the body with pain beyond its normal level of endurance. And so Siddhartha was really adamant about following the path of self-mortification for six long years. So he fasted for days on end and you know, did this until his body looked like a skeleton cloaked in its skin. He sat for hours and hours in the heat of the sun you know, in the cold of the night, which are just really torturing all the ways you could imagine torturing your body. And he subjected his flesh to torments, the whipping that almost killed him. And his practice was so intense, actually. He was so good at this <laughs> that after a while, the five ascetics who had <coughs> trained him started to become his followers. They were like, this guy is so good at torturing himself. <laughs> dedicated. We're going to follow him. He's, he's crazy. <laughs> However, at the end of six years, he still, still wasn't it. This is still not enlightenment. This is not it. So he decided that he just needed to redouble his efforts with this torture kind of thing. And so, you know, supposedly he only ate one grain of rice a day. That was what he was going to do. And actually, he did this until he was a skeleton. He was dying. The Buddha was actually obviously dying. And some of you have seen statues or images of Siddhartha in this emaciated state, the statues of them. And this represents the period right before he became the Buddha. Okay, This is, this is that state. And as he was literally dying, this peasant girl named Sujata saw this starving monk 
lying under a tree near the uh, Niranjara River and begged him, please eat some of this uh, milk rice. And in his delirium, or maybe because he knew he was dying, he agreed. He accepted the offering of food and agreed to taste it. And interestingly, when the other five, his buddies, his five ascetics saw him uh, doing this, their leader, they concluded that he had given up and had taken to what they called the ways of the flesh. And so they abandoned him. They left him there. They're like, yeah, you know, he just couldn't hack it. He had to eat, you know. So happily, the peasant girl continued to feed him. And after a while, when he was feeling a little better, still eating his rice, he noticed a fisherman in a nearby river. And what he noticed was that the fisherman was trying too hard. He was tugging the rope way too tight. And it finally broke, and the fisherman lost his fish. This is what the Buddha noticed. A little while later, apparently at dusk, he heard a group of young girls singing on their way to the city. And he, quote, with strings too loose, the lute does not sound. Tighten the strings too much, they will break apart. Not too loose, not too tight, the lute sounds nice. Not too loose, not too tight, the lute sounds nice. Okay. So it was here that Siddhartha realized that the extreme practices that he'd been using was not leading him to wisdom or enlightenment at all. And in fact, it was leading him to physical weakness and deterioration of his mind. And he finally understood and had that connection that the body and mind, body and mind are not disconnected, okay? That we, in order to have a healthy mind, we also need to have a healthy body, okay? This might seem like common sense right now, but at 2,600 years ago, that was not the belief. The body, he realized, was home. This is where the spiritual life is. It's in this body. It's home. This is it. It's not outside the body. So he also realized that taking care of his body was not only for his own benefit, but for the benefit of others. If he wasn't in good physical condition, if he was tired and weak and not of sound mind, how was he going to be of any kind of benefit to anyone? He wasn't going to be able to lead or teach or do anything. In fact, other people would need to take care of him. So how is that helping, right? So Buddhist teachers often compare the idea of looking after the body to the way an ambulance driver might look after her ambulance, right? So an ambulance, a well-maintained ambulance, is going to have the best chance of being available and ready when people need it. Isn't that interesting, right? So Siddhartha decided to spend time healing his body and his mind, uh, which included meditating and practicing walking meditation and bathing himself in the river. So he was really just nurturing himself back to health under this tree. And while he was doing this and doing his walking meditation in the fields, this uh, boy came by. It was a buff called a buffalo. They called him a buffalo boy in the teachings. And the reason for this is in those times in India, water buffaloes were used to pull the plows. And the buffalo boy's job was to watch them and take care of them and cut grass for them. And so for weeks, this boy had been watching Siddhartha walking and meditating and he was just drawn to his peaceful energy. We all know people like that, right? Some monks, and they just seem peaceful. And so he was drawn to his Buddha's energy, and, but he was shy, this boy. And so every day he needed, he just walked a little closer, a little closer, a little closer, until finally, after a half a dozen times, he gathered the courage to say to the Buddha, gentlemen, I like you very much. I just think it's so sweet. <laughs> Gentlemen, I like you very much. And Siddhartha looked at the boy and said, I like you too. So the boy was apparently so joyful about this that he told Siddhartha that he really wanted to give him a gift, but he was poor. And so he was embarrassed that he had nothing to give him. But Siddhartha said to him, actually, you do have something that I need. You have something that I need. You have all that beautiful grass, that green grass that you just cut for the buffalo, and I would be so grateful for an armful of that grass to use as a cushion for my sitting. Could you please offer that to me? 
during his former time as an ascetic when he was torturing the body using any kind of padding at all for sleep and definitely not for meditation. It was considered an indulgence to have any kind of padding. So this very simple request, can I please have some grass, a pile of grass to sit on, was his way, his first step towards the middle way. This was it, that request. Can I have that? And I just want to put that out there for those of us who have a hard time asking for things, just to think about that. What do you really need you know, to ask for? So after this boy had gleefully collected this armful of grass for the Siddhartha, he spread it out for him underneath the tree. This is when Siddhartha made this, his decision. Okay, this is it. I am going to sit on the tree until I reach enlightenment. This is it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to sit here. And he did. He sat for seven weeks, 49 days, under this tree. And most people assume that he was also eating and having his bodily functions and such as well. It wasn't just sitting there. And the girl and the boy were still taking care of him during this time. And in fact, these two caretakers of the Siddhartha were his first two students after the Buddha's enlightenment. And if you're interested, anybody, in the Pali Canon, there's a scripture called the Sutra of the of Tending Buffalo. The Sutra of Tending Buffalo. And it lists 11 skills a buffalo boy must have, which the Buddha later taught as parallel skills for the monks, right, as a mindful practice. So after the Buddha achieved enlightenment, these five ascetics who were near, still nearby, they could just see that something had changed. Something was different about the Buddha, about Siddhartha. And so they approached him. And he looked so radiant and peaceful that they, of course, wanted to know how, what's different. How did you do this? And according to legend, this is when the Buddha gave his very first talk, or sutra. And this is the Dhamma Chakra Sutta, which is setting the wheel of Dharma in motion. And it's also called the first turning of the wheel which is said to keep spinning as it's taught. The wheel has not stopped spinning. And after this first talk that the Buddha gave to the ascetics at Deer Park, the Buddha began by saying that there are four noble truths. This is when he did that. Okay. And the four noble truths, I'm singing to the choir here, I think, is, what's the first noble truth? There is suffering. Yeah. Isn't that a truth? It's not saying all life is suffering, but there is suffering. The second noble truth is there's a reason. I'm summarizing. There's a reason for the suffering. There is an end to the suffering, thank God, or Buddha. And the way out of this suffering is the noble eightfold path. Those are the four noble truths. So an e really easy way to remember the Four Noble Truths, I think, is by recalling that the Buddha was often described as a healer or a doctor. And so the four are often seen as a kind of prescription. There is an illness. There's a reason for the illness. There is a cure. And that cure is the Eightfold Path. I like to think of it that way, to remember. So in his first talk, the Buddha described what he called the Middle Way. And I'll read the first part of this sermon from the sutta itself, because I like to listen to the Buddha's words, and I like you to hear them. And the Buddha told the ascetics, there are two extremes that are not to be indulged in by one who has gone forth. And gone forth, by the way, again, means gone forth into homelessness, onto the path, into a path of a monk or nun. Which two? That which is devoted to sensual pleasure with reference to to sensual objects, base, vulgar, common, ignoble, unprofitable, and that which is devoted to self-affliction, painful, ignoble, unprofitable. Avoiding both of these extremes, the middle way realized by the Tathagata, which is a term for the Buddha, one who has gone thus, and per, uh, reached enlightenment, Tathagata. So avoiding both of these extremes, the middle way realized by the Tathagata, produces vision, producing knowledge, leads to calm, to direct knowledge, to self-awakening, to unbinding. And what is the middle way realized? 
by the Tathagata that producing vision, producing knowledge leads to calm, to direct knowledge, to self-awakening, to unbinding. Precisely this noble eightfold path, right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Okay. So it's helpful whenever we think about these eight, there's eight of them, to visualize them as spokes on a full wheel and that they all roll together, that they develop as a whole. Okay. For instance, in order to have right speech, we also need right understanding and right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, and right thought. They all go together. And if you think of the wheel as a representation of our lives, it's a kind of a 3D mandala, right? The wheel, think of it as 3D almost even. Expand it out even further in your mind that way. And what we're trying to do in essence through our practice is to make our wheel whole and solid so that our ride, our human journey, is less painful and more smooth. So we do this by learning how to work with that first noble truth, the truth of suffering or dukkha in Pali. And the word dukkha, D-U-K-K-H-A, actually embodies a whole host of unpleasant experiences. So it refers to anything that is uneasy, uncomfortable, unpleasant, difficult, disappointing, or really anything that causes pain and sadness. And I love the, the uh, if you break up the word dukkha, the prefix do and the root is ka, K-H-A. Do means bad or difficult, and ka, K-H-A, means empty, difficult and empty. And a very famous metaphor for dukkha asks us again to imagine a wheel, this time the wheel of an ox cart, you know, because that's what they had back then. And if the empty axle in the middle isn't smooth and round and whole, we get a very bumpy ride. Dukkha, you can imagine it's rattling. We get a bumpy ride. It might be also helpful to know that the opposite of dukkha is sukha, which means happiness and comfort and ease and even bliss. And many of you may know I named one of my cats sukha. Brings me happiness, comfort, ease, and bliss. <laughs> and you might imagine that by honing the wheel of the Dharma, what we're trying to achieve is more sukha, a smoother, less difficult ride. So if you can continue with this image of a wheel, it's actually divided into three sections, our wheel. Okay? So there's ethical conduct, sila, mental discipline, samadhi, and wisdom, which is pana or prajna, okay? Three sections. And what's important to remember is that the practice needs to include all three, has to have all three. So for instance, we can't just practice mental discipline. We also need to nurture wisdom and great compassion, or it's not gonna lead us to transformation if we don't have all three. So, for instance, someone could use the mental discipline part of the wheel to become really focused and clear and concentrated and become a really great sniper or maybe a really great con man, you know? I'm gonna get really good at this. In fact, I worry a lot as a confession about what I consider kind of modern, some of the modern MIG mindfulness that's being taught out there because it's really selling everyone short if it doesn't include the 2,600 years of teaching and wisdom that's underneath it. It's missing the other spokes of the wheel, especially the wheel, the teachings on sila, ethical conduct, and wisdom, right? Again, 2,600 years of teaching. It's missing that. There's such a depth. It's like it's skimming the surface. So, for instance, Bhikkhu Bodhi, one of the great teachers, teaches that if someone only focus on the emotional aspect of the path, the heart practices, and neglects the wisdom and mental discipline aspects, one may become, quote, a good-hearted fool. Right? 
And if a person only focuses on the intellectual side, maybe memorizing all the suttas and the teachings and learning how to speak Sanskrit and all that, but neglects the heart practices, this may turn someone into, quote, a hard-hearted intellect without feelings for others. You know? so, so there's caution there. And before I go on, I also really want to explain as we go along, and I'll repeat this, the word right, since there's been a lot of discussion in modern day times about this because it's really not uh, translated well in English, the word right. This is because in the West we hear the word right and it can be super off-putting, like this is the only way or this is the right way to do it. And it's dictatorial, the word right, I think. In modern day translation, the word right is something more along the lines of wholesome, skillful, most beneficial, with no harm as the key. The idea is no harm. Right means no harm. So it's not a, you know, the way you have to or should do it. It's like this is going to be the most benefit and no harm. Sometimes it's also called wise, wise effort, wise view. I kind of like that sometimes better, but I like like the traditional right for some reason. So that's the background, which is a lot. And in the time we have left, I want to briefly, very briefly summarize these eight noble paths on our journey, which, again, hopefully I'll be able to flesh out a little bit more in the next few months. So the first of these is ethical conduct, which is the trainings on love and compassion. And there are three spokes in this section of the wheel. And all of them, again, involve this concept, this key element of no harm. Okay? So there's right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Right speech means that we use our practice to constantly be on the lookout for what, how what we're saying is landing on other people with the ultimate aim, again, of no harm, like keeping it constantly in mind. At the same time, we're using our mindfulness practice to choose speech that's going to lead to connection and a sense of friendliness and a sense of goodwill. So there's an intentionality around it. And the intentionality is to use words that are gentle and true and useful. We are also being asked to restrain ourselves from using harmful speech, including telling lies, talking negatively about others, using speech that may bring about hatred and disunity, separation among individuals and groups of people, and using speech that is harsh or rude or impolite or malicious or abusive. I just want to say I think some of our government leaders could use all this training right now. Right? It's the exact opposite. We're also asked, I think, interestingly, to refrain from using, quote, foolish babble and gossip, <laughs> or speech that is idle or useless. And so I think the Buddha probably wouldn't approve of a lot of what we post on Facebook. <laughs> right. So the Buddha also taught that if we can't seem to think of anything nice or kind to say, to practice noble silence. And the noble Buddhist saying that I love is, do not speak unless it improves upon the silence. Do not speak unless it improves upon the silence. And a more modern one that I love is the acronym WAIT, <laughs> which is, stands for why am I talking? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so right action means that we should be mindful about how our actions are landing on others and what are we creating? What are we creating in the world? You know, how are our actions affecting others? And the Buddha offers us some specific guidelines on this and asks us, for instance, to be mindful not to destroy life in any way not to steal things, which also means not taking things that haven't been offered. 
not to lie or be dishonest in our dealings with other people, and to be careful about how we're using our sexual energies. So at the same time, just like with speech, we're being asked to mindfully cultivate actions that will be helpful to others, rather than focusing on what's in it for us. The focus is on non-harm, and it's on benefit to others always. So this is so brief, I keep wanting to go more on each one of these, but right livelihood, then, is to focus on our biggest action, really, what we do all day. Right live, what do we do all day? And ask ourselves, what are we doing to make a living? Really, really question it. So we might, for instance, ask, is doing this work only benefiting me, or is it benefiting others? Maybe, am I getting a paycheck but doing something that might be harmful to others? No. For instance, are we making a living by trading in arms? And lethal weapons, intoxicants, poisons, maybe building private prisons, or maybe in ones that imprison children. You know, that's happening. That is happening right now. People are making money off of that. That's their livelihood. Are we involved in a profession that involves killing animals in any way? or cheating others. No. At the same time, just like with the other two, we should strive to be in jobs that help others or ones that at least don't cause any harm. Okay? If it can't be helpful, make sure it's at least not causing anybody any harm. So that's the first category, ethical conduct. The second category is mental discipline. And this includes, again, three spokes. This is right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So right effort also involves the concept of no harm and cultivating good, and includes what are called the four great efforts. Here's another four. These are the four great efforts. And these are to prevent unwholesome states of mind from arising, to remove unwholesome states that have already arisen, to cultivate wholesome states of mind that haven't yet arisen, and to maintain and build upon the good and wholesome states of mind that have arisen. Okay, so I'll go over that in more detail, the whole practice. But with right mindfulness now or attentiveness, this includes cultivating what are called, here's another four, the four foundations of mindfulness. And these are going to be drawn out in detail in what's the, called the Satipatthana Sutra, which is really the main sutta of study for the entire practice. It's really our guide to how to practice, the long sutra, the Satipatthana Sutra, that includes the four foundations of mindfulness. And again, to very briefly summarize the four foundations of mindfulness, it means being diligently and mindfully aware of four things, the activities of the body, Kaya, K-A-Y-A, body. Sensations of feelings, Vedana. The activities of the mind, Sita. And the ideas, thoughts, and conceptions and things of Dharma practice. Okay, you guys with me? I need a little chalkboard up here while all these. So the third mental factor, factor of mental discipline is right concentration which leads in steps to what are called the ten jhanas. And these are trance-like states of bliss or insight, free from hatred, greed, and delusion, those three poisons. That's a good one. Yeah, I promise you I will spend more time on that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go into the jhanas, yeah. And finally, the third category, wisdom, includes just two of the spokes. So there's three, three, and then two. And this is right thought and right understanding. So right thought means many things, but ultimately it means letting go. Think about right thought, letting go through our practice of our attachment, including our attachment to an idea of a solid, permanent self. It's a naka. Because this causes our attachment is what causes ourselves and others so much suffering. 
And at the same time, it also means cultivating thoughts that, again, focus on no harm, kindness, compassion, and selflessness, because these benefit not only ourselves, but others. You guys are seeing a theme here. So right understanding, the eighth spoke on the wheel, is understanding things as they are. And this really means understanding the Four Noble Truths. Okay? So right understanding is recognizing understanding there is suffering. There's a reason for suffering. There's a cure for suffering. And that cure is the Noble Eightfold Path. <laughs> so finally, I find it really helpful to remember that the whole path that we're walking is born out of acknowledging the first noble truth of dukkha, there is suffering. The whole thing is born out of that. None of the teachers I know, including myself and my own teachers, started on this path because we were feeling blissful and wanted more of that. <laughs> it's not how it starts, right? And they stepped onto the path maybe because some of you, as some of you have, they were in great pain and wanted their way out. How do I figure this out? And that's why the Buddha left. I see suffering in myself and others. How, how, do, how do I work with this? The odd paradox of Bhikkhu Bodhi so wisely points out is that when you start walking on the path, quote, it doesn't start with lights and ecstasy, but with the hard tax of pain, disappointment, and confusion. Anybody experience that? <laughs> why did I... Start meditating. What the hell is this, right? <laughs> Why did I do that? But you're all, many of you are still here, so that's a good thing. <laughs> and the idea is that it's a hard path, and it's often called in the Mahayana tradition a warrior's path. And what we need to remember is that the way out is through. Always, the way out is through. We need to face our suffering and get to know the terrain and the houses and the buildings and all the people inside these little villages of suffering in ourselves until we can reach, if you will, that land of Oz. And it's like Dorothy walking along the yellow brick road, that path. She got there because she was in pain, right? She was looking for a way out of her situation. And was it a nice and easy road to Oz? She was attacked by flying monkeys, right? <laughs> Another horrible thing. They stole her dog. I mean, so she did encounter some nice poppy fields along the way. <laughs> but she really needed to face a lot of fear and delusion and challenges. And if you'll let me continue with this metaphor, she also discovered at the end of the road that what she needed was already there. Right, right inside of her. It was always there waiting for her. And she just needed to know and understand how to get home. Know and understand how to get home. It's always there. So this is our, you know, Buddhism's yellow brick road. And luckily for us, the Buddha gave us a really good map. Okay. So I think I'll end there and just invite us all into a practice together just for a moment to end, just closing the eyes. Just taking a nice deep breath in, deep breath out. And as always, if any of you would like to, you can always place a hand on the heart to connect with your heart. You might even imagine breathing right into the heart. Just letting the mind and body settle. And remembering this radical, revolutionary teaching that the body is home. The spiritual life is right here. It's not anywhere else. It's right here here in your heart. And you might remember that you too have everything you need already. It's already here. You just have to find it. 
So see if you can just for a moment touch into that sense of home in the body and really recognize that what you need is right there. You might also spend a little time investigating your intention. Investigating your intention for yourself. And does it involve no harm to yourself or others? Could it involve a sense of kindness, compassion, selflessness? To plant that seed of intention. There is suffering. There is suffering. There is a reason for suffering. There is a way out of suffering. There is a way out. 